Hey guys, this is Russ or Nachum Russell, but Russ to most of you because no one could say Nachum. And this is my live show that I do every week called Not Just Dogs. This is my friend Meg of Hello. Meg. Meg, I'm not going to say it right. <laughs> go, 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 go. I won't fault you. I know it's not Doherty. See? Yeah, yeah. It is? Doherty. Doherty. Okay. Yeah. This is Meg Doherty of the Everyday Trainer in Orlando, Florida. And I'm very excited to have her on. Meg, do you want to tell us a little bit about your training program and what you do? Yeah. So I do a couple things. I do board and trains, obviously, right now. But another thing that I do that's kind of unique to dog training is I do daily training. Um, so it's me and a couple other trainers that I've trained and we go to people's houses every day and train dogs. That's very cool. Is that how you came up with the everyday trainer? Yes. So I was originally a dog walker and I started with the OG Meg walks them. Um, and then I realized that I was really training these people's dogs. Like if you go from walking a dog at heel to not walking a dog at heel, you're like, oh, this is awful. Right. <laughs> I don't want to do this. And so I found myself kind of training people's dogs and I was like, I can, I can do something out of this. So yeah, the everyday trainer kind of turned into that. And I love what I do so far. And how many trainers do you have working underneath you? You said you have a team of trainers. Yeah. So I have two trainers. Um, right now, one is actually back home in South Florida working for another trainer right now, but I'll get her back in May. So then I'll have three. So they do all of the daily training and then I focus on training them and do boarding trains. Cool. So then right now during, because of lockdown, you're only doing boarding trains. Yeah, unfortunately. But I mean, I don't know. I'm thankful because with having that business everything is like go 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 all the time like we're driving around orlando all the time always trying to find new people so like having the time to really pause i can reflect on my business and like okay what things do i want to do better what things do i want to change what things do i want to stop doing which i think is important right i'm grateful so Every trainer that I speak to, and I've spoken to a lot of trainers in the past couple of years, every trainer that I speak to has their own interesting story of how they got into this. So what, what's gotten you, like, how do you get into, I guess, first of all, working with dogs, because you said you were walking dogs first, mm -hmm. and then what made you want to say, like, okay, I'm going to actually become a trainer, not just a dog walker? Yeah. Um, so I've been around animals, like, my entire life, I knew I always wanted to do something with animal behavior, which is why I'm actually from Missouri, from Kansas City. That's why I said, oh, Martha, she's from right. Missouri, because she's like the only other dog trainer that I you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I moved to Orlando and went to University of Central Florida to study biology um, because I wanted to get like an animal behavior internship over at SeaWorld or Busch Gardens, like one of those zoos. Um, and I worked at a local zoo over here during my time in undergrad where I was like an alligator feeder, actually. Like I was one of those people who would stand on the bank with alligators and like wave the meat in their face. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when people are like, are you scared of aggressive dogs? I'm like, no, not particularly. You um, kind of forced to get over that one quickly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I was like making minimum wage feeding alligators. It was crazy. Um, so I was doing that. And then um, I worked at a wildlife rehab place. So I just had all of these like animal jobs, but none of them were really fulfilling to me because I've worked with, I don't know, a million different types of animals and no animal has the connection that dogs have. Like you're just yeah. never going to find the connection that dogs have to people because you can train other animals all day long, but at the end of the day, they're really, they really only look to you for food, you know? And I feel like a lot of the, I mean, this isn't always the case, but I feel like a lot of the time people put their own emotions on like connections with those kinds of animals. And so I just, I didn't feel that as much. So I actually went to grad school at the University of Kentucky, and at that time, I got my second dog, Lucy, and she is crazy, as all other dog trainers start off. They have a great yeah. dog, 
So I was in grad school at the time and I had a full-time job and was taking classes and had a six month old psychopath for a puppy. So I was just going crazy, trying to figure out like, what am I supposed to do with this dog? I almost got rid of her. It was just, it was a big thing. So I ended up moving back to Orlando after a year of grad school and I had no job. And I was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I have to pay rent. So I started my own dog walking business and I just had this like serendipitous encounter with this woman at a um, nursery, actually. I had a t-shirt on that had a dog and she's like, oh, are you a dog walker? And I was like, yes, actually I am. <laughs> and um, so she was my first client. Um, and I don't know if you've seen Teddy, he's like the giant fluffy golden retriever that I have. He's just like, he is my logo. Like he was my first dog that I trained. He was everything. So from there I trained him and a few other dogs before I kind of fully transitioned to becoming a trainer. But yeah, cool. that's and my story. Did you, did you actually get any like hands-on experience working with these other animals besides feeding them? Did you do training with any of these other animals? Um, I worked a lot with reptiles. So there's really not a whole right. lot training that you can do i will say it did teach me a lot about like the energy that you have when you're handling animals because if you like reach into a snake enclosure and you're not confident about grabbing that snake like that snake is gonna know and it's gonna bite you but if you're like calm and confident just like dog training yeah. animals pick up on our energy so much better than we do um, so working with reptiles really taught me that. And also the, the like reactive nature of them. So I actually got bit by a baby gator one time <laughs> at work because I like was going to tape its mouth and I like flinched back. And so it immediately like jerked to go get me. So it's kind of the same thing with dogs. Whereas like if you're hesitant or if you like don't really if you're not confident in what you're doing they're gonna pick up on that and they'll be like all right she has no idea what she's doing like right i think that's that's an extremely important skill that or it's more than just a skill it has be, it has to become like a part of who you are it's it's not necessarily something that could be taught it's yeah. something you learn but not necessarily that could be taught right like you learn it from those experiences and you learn it from being kind of thrown into a situation where you have to yeah. i know like my friend has snakes. I don't go near them, but, <laughs> <laughs> but like, I'll tell you why I used to go near them. I used to hold them and I got bit so many times by his snakes Yeah, and, and I was very calm and chilled with them. But I think I just smelled like dog too much to them or something <laughs> and they wanted to eat me. That's my theory. What did, but, he get what? did he get bit? No. Yeah. Like that's they're his dogs. I mean, they're his, they're his snakes. Like they would never <laughs> bite him, but, but like they, I would just be holding him just relax and then like I would just be sitting very relaxed he put it on my lap and the snake would just come right up and just start eating me like biting me I was like okay this is not happening that's but how they are it's pretty crazy but the thing I think they're really good at having like a calm energy and like before we went live when you were saying like I'm not an anxious person really and I'm like yeah I can tell that's good yeah like, to be like that you know the thing with like I recently was speaking about this on my Instagram, but the thing with dogs, right? And and that you got to learn this from reptiles. And I think the reason why, with, I don't, again, I don't know a lot about reptiles, but that reptiles, I would imagine is much more of a energetic communication than anything else, right? Because even their body language is so far into the way we do things. Like dog body language is a lot more similar to ours, right? Yes. A, a yeah. nervous, scared person is going to be crouched. A nervous, scared dog is going to be crouched. There's a lot more that we could read into it from our human experience that makes sense on the dog's body. But with reptiles, there's none of that. They're so far and they're not, they're a whole different thing. And that you have to there's do. also like not much to them, you know, like right. they are very simple in that sense. Like, okay, one cool fact about alligators is they have these um, sensors along their jaw so if you if they're in the water and if you like drop something at one end of the lake, the alligator uses its sensors along its mouth and can actually like feel the vibrations in the water up to a mile away. So that's if so you, cool. 
Yeah, if you drop like a piece of meat next to the alligator's mouth, they'll instinctually go and react. Like it's not, there's no thought behind it. There's no anything, like it's just instinct. And I think that's what's cool about reptiles and like it can kind of carry into over into dogs. Cause like, I'm sure you've met those dogs before where it's just like their minds are going so fast that they're just like always reacting. So. That's the equivalent of reptiles. That's pretty cool, though. I got my new alligator fact. I'm going to tell it to someone as if I know what I'm talking about. A person that would, like, stand, like, with a snake and be like, this is a whatever kind of snake, and it lives here, and it eats this. So I have, like, an absurd amount of <laughs> reptiles. Random reptile facts. Yeah. So I'm glad it's okay. useful today. The cool thing about that with when it comes to dogs is like that energy is everything, right? Like we've any dog trainer who's worked with a couple of dogs, like you don't need that many, has seen the dog that goes as soon as it goes from the owner's hand and into your hand, how everything shifts, right? And yeah. it's not because you got some magic, it's simply because the energy is so different, right? Yes, that's and, so funny that you say that. Um, yeah. We see it. I'm sure you see it like any we, we all see it. Right. And it's not really. A, of course, there's things to it, like maybe the way we're standing, the, maybe because the dog doesn't know us yet and knows the owner as something else. But like there's also an energy to it. I believe that energy is very strong with animals. Oh, and, definitely, definitely. I think you could have a relationship with a dog and not ever say anything like people 100%. have deaf dogs, you know, yeah. and they can have the exact same relationship. Yep. And I think sometimes it's stronger, like without the talking. Yeah. Because a lot of times, like, I have to tell people, stop. <laughs> Don't say anything. Yep. Like, what do I need to say? Like, what command do I need to give? I'm like, nothing. Don't say anything. You know, like, just, just try to be. With yeah. It. Recently, in, in the past, I would say six, seven months, like, I've started doing something different with a lot of board and train dogs. Not all of them, because some of them I can't do this with. But we're on the first day, I'll simply take their leash and I won't, I won't do any training with them. I'll simply take their leash and hold it and sit next to them. And every time they pull away from me, I bring them back to me. And every time they jump on me, I push them off of me. And I'll just stay very calm and relaxed. Like I'll go sit outside where it's really relaxing somewhere or put on music and just chill, like space out. Yeah. And But the idea is just forcing the dog to be calm with me, but without any of that verbal stuff that just kind of becomes static when there's no meaning to it. And it's, it's a very powerful thing to do. If you just make a dog sit, obviously if you're sitting there really anxious, it's not going to help. <laughs> yeah, but, like, uh... yeah. But if you can become really relaxed, it's going to change the way the dog feels exactly. like right away. So what do you do to teach owners that? Cause that's one of the biggest struggles yeah. that I have. And I talk to like other trainers about this all the time of like, the energy that you have, I think, is the most important thing when it comes to dog training. But it's really hard to convince owners of that because they want like a solution to problems where they're like, I don't really care about that, but like fix the barking or like, I don't yeah. care about that, but fix this, you know. So how do you go about that? So I think there's and I think that part of that is that you don't necessarily get to teach them that always, but you can start to mimic because essentially that whole energy thing is about relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And it can be very difficult for an owner to change all of that. Essentially, you're telling them to start doing some personal development stuff, right? <laughs> all right. That's really what it is. It's like saying like, learn to breathe more, learn to relax more, stop thinking about everything because that's how anxiety builds up, right? Or that's how like nervousness builds up. It's from thinking and overthinking and not breathing and not slowing down your life and, and, you can't really expect somebody who that's who they are to just switch that because you're some dog trainer who told them to do that. Right. right. It would be awesome if it was that simple. There would also be nobody with anxiety issues. So, but I think what we could do is use tools like e-collars, prong collars, tools that help to bridge that gap so that the owner can see the possibility of where it could go. And, They'll so if you bring back, let's say, board and trains are a prime example for this. And I don't know how your day training works, but I'm sure there's a way that this can fit in too. But let's say after a board and train, my program is three weeks and a dog goes back home and the dog is being extremely relaxed, right? So we've taken a dog that's mind is up here and we've taught it to relax and settle down. 
and the owner gets to see that, they're automatically going to get more relaxed because a big part of their anxiety about their dog is the way the dog is always like that, right? So if we can kind of fix bring the dog- the equation. Yeah, well, I missed that. Like if you fix one half of the yeah. equation, yeah, then it like teaches- Makes it easier. And it's it's always gonna be work and, and we're not gonna necessarily get owners to be at that exact same space. And I think that's where a big part of the tools come into play is having a way of kind of mimicking it without having that full energy and relationship stuff that would be awesome if every dog owner had, but we can't necessarily expect that, but we can mimic it. And we could also show them what's possible, like the potential, if they could get there. And we can also help get them there quicker by bringing their dog there first. Does that make sense? Yeah, I like that. I, I have the same kind of mentality. Like, that's why I love the e collars because, like, owners who are like, oh, my dog is driving me nuts. Like, I have no way to tell it no, it doesn't listen to me or whatever it may be. It's like, you don't have to yell. You don't have to right. get upset. Just press this button. Like, it really simplifies the whole thing for them. Yeah. And a big part of the anxiety that owners have. Not not like an owner who just is overall an anxious person, but the anxiety that they have surrounding their dogs is not having a way to communicate with them that works, right? So it's like if you're trying to be in a relationship with somebody who, I don't, do you speak Chinese? I don't speak Chinese. Right? And it's like if you're if you're trying to be in a relationship with someone who only speaks Chinese and you only speak English and you really want to have that relationship, it's going to be extremely frustrating, right? Yeah. And there's you have to find like common ground right yeah a and by giving an owner a way to communicate with the dog like automatically there's less of a reason to be anxious and not only giving them a way to communicate giving them a way to communicate that works and that doesn't require any emotion right that's the, that's what i found that's and that's why like again like you said e-collars are the shit because <laughs> it gets you there so much quicker and it allows the any average owner to just follow this plan and it will work it's that yeah. simple. Yeah. Like I got my first e-collar from Bethany and it changed my life. Like it completely changed my relationship with Lucy because Lucy in particular is not very, um, she's not very good with verbal commands. Like my first mm -hmm. dog, Zoe, she's great with verbal commands and I never had to teach her like any hand signals or leash pressure or anything like that. She was just really smart with like what I would say and paid attention to what I would say. And Lucy gets very distracted easily. So like my problem with her is she would take off running. She would be gone for hours. She would just, she would run miles away. And at the time when she was running away, I lived like at the edge of a forest and she would just go into the forest and be gone. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do with this dog? So when I got the e-collar, I was like, wow, I can communicate with her like off leash. That's amazing. Yeah, it's such a game changer. I know with, with my Lucy, his name is Marley, but my psycho dog, <laughs> since we don't have to have one. So he like, I did a lot of work with him before ever getting an e-collar because I didn't know how to use it. So I was not going to use it and I was very nervous about it. But I did a lot of work with him without prior to the e-collar first like with slip leads and and prong collars and food and all that <laughs> stuff but yeah but when i added the e-collar into the picture it changed it all because like it kind of goes like it narrows everything down and it, it kind of goes straight through all that fog that's blocking everything and it just cuts right through it it makes it so much easier and smoother and yeah, again it's amazing it, to see the difference between like the struggle before without an e-collar to using an e-collar, it's almost like instant clarity for the dog. You know, like even the dog is like, oh, this is what you want? Okay, like just get it, you know? And it makes it makes so much more sense to the dog usually. And the, the irony in it all is how many people are against e-collars, yet the e-collar can be so, so gentle. So gentle, so gentle and like, do you have owner? Do you put it on owners? I usually do. I do it at the go home session, um, like everyone in the family. So if there's kids there, they all do it. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. I do it too, and I'll like have the person hold the leash and mm -hmm. like 
mimic what to do with the dog. And they're like, this is it. I'm like, yeah, yeah that's it. Like just that tiny little tingling sensation that you feel. That's it. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun to do that too, because it yeah. kind of breaks the ice of like this tension that everybody's having. And then they're like, Oh, that tickles. And like, that's kind of fun. Like, you we like do that. And you're like, Ta -da. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a fun thing to do. I used, I don't really do the whole dog trainer role play thing with the leash much anymore. I used to do it when I did one-on-ones. Yeah. So one-on-ones, it made a lot of sense to me to do that because I was training the owners how to use the e-collar. Mm -hmm. I don't really do any one-on-one -on -one work, especially not with an e-collar these days. So I don't really do that much unless I have an owner who's like really struggling to just pick up on how this works. And then I'll be like, all right, let's put the dog away and work just with you because yeah. it kind of clears things up a lot. Cool. What's your favorite type of dog to work with? Like, do you have a specialty? My favorite type of dog to work with also has to do with the owners. So, it might sound crazy what I'm going to say, but I love owners who are extremely desperate. <laughs> and, because I don't like, I don't like owners who are like, yeah, it would be cool if our dog listened better. You know, it would be nice if he stopped biting. You know, like I like owners where like, it's like, we need him to do this. We yeah. need him. Yeah. Because, but that's just an owner side of it. In terms of like dogs that I like, I like crazy dogs. I like, I like dogs that are like the one I have now is a lot of fun for me because yeah. he was like least reactive. And, yeah. Oh, and sure. he was least reactive and psycho and didn't know how to calm down and jumping on everybody. And the doctor wanted him on meds and like oh. all of that craziness. Those are the fun ones for me because they're more challenging. Um, I don't like working with fearful dogs. Okay. Um, I just, it's, I, I've done it and I could, it's just not as, I guess it's not as much fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't like bratty dogs. I don't like yeah. when owners like really spoil the dog and then the dog comes to you and they're like, oh, God, you're the worst. You're making me sit still. I'm like, oh my gosh. Those are my yeah. least favorite. Any kind of, I don't want to like stereotype, but um, golden doodles are not my favorite. <laughs> I've had so many doodles in the past year. It's like when I finally started, like I had a streak of, of like a couple of months where all I was getting was doodles. So I had golden doodles, labradoodles, bernadoodles, and every type of doodle. And when I finally got, I think I got a Westie that changed it. I was, just, I didn't care what type of dog it was. I was just so excited that it wasn't the doodle. And yeah. like, they have a very specific temperament. Like they're smart, but they're also, they can be like pretty stubborn. And I also feel like the owner's, that get doodles want to treat them like babies. Yeah. You have like this dog that's like, I am everything. And you're like, oh gosh. <laughs> Katie over here said doodles are job security. <laughs> that's so true. There's that feel this way about doodles. Am I the only one? <laughs> no, it's so true. Like, and the, yeah, the average, think about why someone's getting a dog called a doodle. Okay. They're not getting a, a German Shepherd or like a Doberman or even a Golden Retriever. Like, just think about the name, Doodle, right? <laughs> Nothing about it sounds like you're going to take that relationship serious. I know. I know. When I like get an inquiry, I'm like, please no Doodle. And then it's usually a Doodle, but it's okay. Yeah. I'm happy to have a Golden because I'm kind of biased to Goldens these days. So I'm really excited to have one. I know you love Goldens. I love Goldens so much. They're just the best. I used to not like Goldens. Like, Really? You know, when I first came, so I have three dogs, right? I have Marley, I have Mama Bear, and I have Hendrix. So Marley's my, Marley is the Golden. No, I'll, no. I'll break it down. Okay. So Marley's my first dog. He's a ratty mix. Okay. Um, and he's like my wild child. He's the one who got me into all of this. And like, He's my he's my training dog, you know. He's the one that made this yeah. all happen. He's the one. Yeah. He's the one. And then I have Mama Bear, who's my pit, who's like just the sweetest dog in the world. I never really trained her. Um, she just kind of what? She just came that way. Yeah, she just hangs out. She's very chill. Like she's very relaxed. She sleeps most of her life. <laughs> um, and like dogs. <laughs> yeah, and she's really awesome. So, like. 
she has like obviously i trained her a little bit you know she doesn't poop in my house but like that's the extent of it <laughs> and and then i have hendrix who is my golden dude uh, my golden retriever and when i first had when i just had marley and mama beer they're they're like more of like that tough looking dog i guess you could say because marley's like you know he's a, he's a ratty mix and he looks kind of brolic and he's like tough looking yeah. and mama bear even though she's the sweetest thing in the world also has that look so i was like i like dogs that look intimidating that look kind of tough right yeah. and <laughs> and i was like golden retrievers are and also i was working at a daycare a dog daycare so oh. all the golden retrievers there their owners fit a certain stereotype right so and i was like that's not me like i don't have a white picket fence and live in long island and have like two-door garage like that's not me i can't get a golden retriever and then when i met hendrix um he was then his name was cody then and when i met him i was like oh this guy's kind of cool and i took him home not to keep him but i took him home just because he was being fostered at the facility i worked at so i was like and they told me like you have to train him i was i was training there and they're like you have to train him so that we can get him a home so I took him home because he's like, he was completely psycho. So I was like, let me see how he is in a home environment that's completely different than a facility with so much going on. Right. And as soon as I took him home, I was like, this guy's smart as hell. Like he's <laughs> awesome. And he was such a different dog in a home environment. And that was like when my mindset changed on golden retrievers. Now I love them. I get so excited when I see them. I think they're awesome. Like I, I love all really the things that you taught him. I already told you this, but like, the video of you taking him to the school and when he's just like sitting on the chair, like. Yes, he thinks, he thinks he's the like, shit. Like, like, perfect, I love him. That was such a fun day. And he's the perfect dog for things like that because he's really friendly and like great with people, doesn't mind being touched, you know, doesn't have an issue with it. He knows how to get like goofy with children, but also knows how to stop immediately. So he has that perfect balance. But that was, he He sits like that always. Like if you, if, like even now, like he's laying on his place bed and he's like, thinks he's all proper. Like like he thinks he's like some sort of king looking at his peasants. Oh, okay. I don't know exactly. Okay. Um, how old, what, like about how old was he? Was he a puppy when you got him? He was probably... Anywhere from a year to a year and a half. It was very unclear, everything. And I never ended up finding out all the information about him because there was a lot of strange rescue stuff. Um, but I just kept him and changed his name and made him mine. So by now, he's probably about two and a half or three. Like, okay, I think I've had him for two years now. So, yeah, I guess he's about two and a half, three years old. I don't know. I don't know any of my dog's ages, really, to be exact. <laughs> Actually, me neither. I was like telling everyone that my oldest was eight years old, and my dad was actually the one who got her for me. And he's like, "She's not eight. What are you talking about?" And I was like, "Really? <laughs> I thought she yeah. was." And then there's people like having birthday parties for their dogs, and I'm like, mm. "I know, like my dog's gotcha days. Like I know when they became mine. That's like the extent of it. Like How Marley, I don't know what. I know their birth month. That's yeah." Like so I decided Marley's birth month because I got him on I got him on Christmas and they had told me he was about like three or four months old. So I decided that he was born in September and I decided because my birthday is in September. So he had to have the same month as me <laughs> and, and my birthday is September 4th and my dad September 6th. So I made his September 5th. Nice. So that's his birthday that we made up for him. In but, I love that. Yeah. And then Mama Bear, I don't know, because all I know is she's old. But we don't <laughs> know, like, yeah, she's always been old for as long as I've had her. But, like, she was a street dog, so there's no way to know. Yeah. And Hendrix, Hendrix all, he's young. That's all I know about Hendrix. So what is your opinion? I mean, I'm sure I already know. But you worked at a doggy daycare. Yeah. What was that experience like? So it was an awesome experience, actually. And I wouldn't be anywhere where I am today training-wise without all of it. Um, and I would recommend anybody who wants to work with dogs to go there. Not that that's your place to stay, but to go and 
get that experience. Watch dogs um, play, watch them interact with each other. Yeah. So I learned a ton from that because when I went to get a job there, um, they basically on day one handed me a spray bottle, like a water spray bottle, and said, here's the, in they called it the indoor dog park. Here's the dog park. Go in there and make sure the dogs don't fight and that they don't make too much noise. Um, that was basically the extent of my training. So I very quickly had to figure out how to make it work because I loved I loved being around dogs and I was like, this is awesome that I get to work with dogs every day, but it sucked to get a headache at the end of every day and to go home all stressed out from that or to see dog fights. Um, and so I quickly had to learn a lot and it was less learning from like YouTubing and figuring out what's going to work. It was more like on the spot, like trial and error of how I'm going to control a pack of dogs. And it helps me like till today, like we were, we started off talking about energy if your energy is off and you're going to try to control a big group like of 30 or 40 dogs that all come from different homes, good luck with that. You're having a fight, like guaranteed you're having a fight. Oh, yeah. Like if you're stressed and you walk into that, oh, my gosh, I can only imagine. Yeah. So I remember one time when like it, it really hit home for me is I – I like got into like an argument with my dad or something or, and I was like really like I was really angry at him. I was really upset. And then I went into work at like 12 o'clock in the afternoon and I walked in like literally right after having this argument. So like my heart and energy was all like messed up and I was thinking about it and I walked in and as soon as I walked in, dogs started going crazy. Like literally two minutes after being in there, just going nuts. They're and these are the same up on that. Like they know. Yeah. And this was the same dog that knew the same group of dogs that knew me every day. And were really well behaved for me for the most part. So I walked out and I was like, okay, I told my boss, I was like, I'm going for a walk. And I went for a walk and I like relaxed myself. I listened to some music, drank some water. I came back in and everything was very different. And I was able to have them much more calm. But that's the difference between you and like other people is other people might not be able, even be able to recognize that their emotions were like escalated and like how it right. would be affecting dogs. Like, one thing that I learned through daily training. So essentially for daily training, it's like instead of the instead of the dog staying with me, I do the same things that I would do in a board and train, only spread out over the month. Okay, cool. I learned so much from doing this because you have to get the owners on board with everything or it's not gonna work. You know, right. like imagine if you only had the dog half time and someone else had the dog half time, you would be like you need to do these things, like please do them. So I learned really quickly, like what owners are willing to do and what they're not willing to do. And so it's kind of showed me like the balance in it all. And I can try to teach them like, hey, just like take a few deep breaths before you go for a walk, you know, yeah. like little things like that can make a big difference in the energy that you're like, showing your dog um but yeah i learned that very quickly with daily training because i went into training of like oh this is going to be easy i'm naturally good with animals and then you meet people who get dogs that aren't naturally good with animals and they've never worked with animals or they've never been around animals and try to teach them like hey you need to you need to check in with yourself <laughs> you yeah. know so yeah that was one of those yeah, i had like super grateful for for daily training because it showed me like what owners are actually struggling with like what they can actually do in the training yeah that's cool and that's the i guess pros and cons of like board and train versus working with the owners throughout the process is you get one of them you get the dog all the time the other one is you get to train the owner all the time so it's an interesting balance that you have to choose which one you want to go with yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's cool that you do both though, that I'm sure there are some dogs where you're like, okay, this one, I'm only going to do a board and train for it. It'll be better for that dog. Right. Yeah, definitely. And I honestly started daily training for puppies mostly because most board and train trainers don't take on dogs until six months. And so I was seeing all of these dogs that were like missing out on three months of training where it would be so much easier to train a three month old puppy than it would be to train a six month old dog that has been doing whatever it wants up until this point, you know? Yeah. Like, I would rather put the time in the beginning 
and like build the dog up, then work on like correct, correcting bad behaviors later on down the line. So that's actually why I started doing it. Um, but then it worked out for a few other dogs. And now I'm much pickier about the owners that I choose to work with for that because I've had some that are like, you're just the dog trainer, do it for me. I don't want to be involved in it. Like it was more of like me being the help. And I didn't like that because right. I can train your dog all day long. I know that I can train your dog. I need to know that you right. can train your dog or I'm going to be here wasting my time. So like people like that, I'm like, you should do a board and train. <laughs> but then I'll get the really dedicated owner to like, no, I want to learn. I want to do this with you. And I'm like, yes, please let's work together. Because I don't know. I really like the people side of it. Like I like teaching people how to communicate with their dogs more effectively, how to be more mindful. Like it's, it's so much about the owner, especially with daily training um, that I don't know. I like, I like that aspect of it. It could only work with those very dedicated owners, which is cool thing about that is that yeah. you get to kind of be more real with them. It's like, how much do you really want this? And if you really want it the way you say you are like, let's see how that goes. Right. Let's yeah, see the best. And then they'll say like, okay, I want this and I want this and I want my dog to do this and I want off leash stuff. And then you show them all of the effort that goes into that. And they're like, okay, I'm fine with just walking at heel. <laughs> so like, right. It puts things into perspective for them because they see the amount of work that goes into getting a dog to that point. Like mm -hmm. we're not, we're not magicians. Like we don't have this like secret dog training recipe, you know, like we're literally waking up at the ass crack of dawn and walking our dogs and training them and working with them. And the owners see that and they, they, uh, they're a little more forgiving of like what is expected. You know, it changes yeah. the expectations of the whole training thing. So Monique, I guess she came on a little late. She wants to know how everyday training works. So I do it on a monthly basis. And basically, I don't do it anymore. I just have my trainers do it. Um, but my trainers will go to the house, kind of like a dog walker, basically. Um, they'll go to the house for an hour a day, work with the dog. And then um, another thing that I do is I do bi-weekly meetings with the owners. So after the first two weeks, I've taught the dog a certain skill set. So it's typically in the first two weeks, it's walking at heel, structured walks, um, threshold manners, and basic obedience commands. So after the end of that first two weeks, I have a meeting with the owner and I go over everything. I show them how to use the collar, how to use the leash. If we're using an e-collar, I can go over that. And then again, two weeks later to kind of go over everything again. So I really test the owners out at that two week mark to make sure that they're, they're able to continue the training because if they're not continuing it then i can't continue um okay. so yeah it's like a monthly basis i just go five days a week for an hour about an hour each time and then so you're kind of just picking the dog up working with it bringing it back home and then giving the owners in like at what point do the owners let's say if you're only with the dog an hour a day at what point do the owners get the instructions for what is the other 23 hours of their life look like so I have a bunch of like information packets that I send the owners beforehand of like, here are all the commands, here's how to implement them. Um, and then that's also why I share so much to my social media is because I want them to see what I'm doing. So I am basically in contact with the owner the whole time throughout the training. Um, I just try to give them as much content as possible so that they can learn along the way. And typically by the end of it, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm a dog trainer now. <laughs> Just because I'm yeah. like, okay, here's this. This is why we do this. This is why we walk at heel. Whereas, and I'm not saying this is with all board and trains, but sometimes like I've gotten clients who have already been through a board and train and the trainer didn't go over anything with them. They're just like, here's your dog back. It's trained. But it's like, if you don't teach the owner what to do or how to keep up with it, the dog is going to go right back to how they were. So that's my goal is just like, I know that I can train a dog, but can I train the owner to train a dog? That's kind of how daily training is for me. I think it's a very cool program. It's a very, it's a very good way of <clears throat> giving the same 
results essentially that a dog could get from, but making the owner be a part of it and do more of the work. And an owner who does that work is going to feel really fulfilled at the end when they have that dog that they dreamed of at the end of it all. Yeah. And they're going to like, that's a lifelong skill that they have, you know, like if they get another dog down the line, they're going to know how to train it. And I think that's super valuable. Yeah. I love that. I think it's very cool. Daniel over here said, uh, I'm going to take some deep breaths before my walks. It's, in all seriousness, it's a great thing to do. Like, you'll feel better about yourself, too. Forget about the dog. But Daniel <laughs> Daniel just got his first puppy, and we've been doing some FaceTime sessions together. Uh-huh. He's, like, doing really well with it. And he's, like, he prepared himself for this dog. I'll give you a little shout-out, Daniel, because I think it's so awesome. He prepared himself for this dog way before he ever, like, got it or was ready to get it. He read Sean's book, like, months ago. He, you know, loved them by leading them. Yeah. Right? He read that months ago. He's been following my page, asking me questions, like being involved. As I At first, I thought he had a dog when he started asking me questions because he was so interested in learning about it. And he just got his puppy. So he's like really prepared himself a lot for it. So it's cool to see oh, owners do that. Yeah. Like, oh my God, look at my cute puppy. And then they take it home. And it's like, oh, this is a dinosaur that's just really I probably get I probably get five DMs a day from Daniel to make sure he's doing things right. So... <laughs> <laughs> so I know I know that he's serious about it. See, that's um, all awesome. I would do daily training with Daniel. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's cool. That would be a good program for you, but you're not that close, Daniel. So you're stuck with me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but in terms of like the breathing thing, even though you were kind of saying it in a silly way, you got your laughing emoji up with it. But there's some real seriousness to it. I'll tell you, like back to the daycare thing the way that I would relax these dogs is because I didn't have any tools, right? It wasn't like I, after being there for a while and like getting very comfortable and the owners starting to trust me more, I eventually did bring in dressage whips to be able to create space for the dogs. Right. Cool. But, so it was, but it was a long process to getting there way before that though, I learned how to relax these dogs and it was all through me being very relaxed. And literally what I would do when I walked in was I'd, it was this massive space, like a very, very big space indoors. It was like a warehouse type of building. And you'd walk in through the double gates. And as soon as I walked in, I would just walk right through all the dogs and make massive circles, just breathing in through my nose and out through my mouth. Like, I don't know if you know what circular breathing is. Yeah. Right? Like for meditation. <laughs> so I was essentially like doing like meditation breathing technique but while i was walking around these dogs and i would do that over and over and over again for at least 10 or 15 minutes while slowly touching a couple of dogs and moving them away from each other with my hands or with my feet and eventually what would happen is after a half hour 40 minutes all the dogs would be laying down on the floor like zen out that's amazing and, and that's just like energy now obviously there's always those couple of dogs that were just like the complete brats of the class and like there's nothing you could do like that energy is not going to work they needed like a tap on the butt or something yeah. but but for the most part these do and those dogs i would just put on a leash and walk with me so they were forced to stay with me while i was relaxed and all that but breathing is so powerful and like your energy is so powerful and you being present with the dog it's i think like us and our energy and our breathing and our presence is the most overlooked dog training tool in dog training that 100%. what 100 percent, i agree yeah. and i think the reason why it's so overlooked is because two things number one it sounds very like hippy dippy ish so everyone's like okay we don't do that we just train dogs and it's very trainy trainy but training. The <laughs> but like the reality is there's so much seriousness to it and also because it's like we said in the beginning, it's the hardest thing to teach. So I can teach you how to use an e-collar, right? But I, it's much harder to sit and start teaching somebody how to relax themselves and how to breathe and how to be present and all of that stuff. And that takes a lot of work. It does. Shameless meditation. Plug. Yeah. Um, so I started meditating when I was in grad school because I felt like a crazy person. <laughs> I was just so stressed all the time. So I started doing um, guided meditation, like through one of the apps that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I kind of fell off when I moved back to Orlando just because like things are better. So you're like, oh, I'm fine. I don't need it anymore. Um, but one thing that has had a huge impact on my training not only how i communicate with the dogs but how i communicate with the owners like 
any kind of reactivity on my own part has been because of meditating every morning. Like it yeah. is a part of my routine. Some days I'm like, yes, I'm going to do it for an hour and I'll sit there for an hour. Some days I'm like, okay, five minutes <laughs> and that's it. But it's just like the act of sitting still and watching your thoughts. You can really check in with yourself and be like, okay, my thoughts are going a thousand miles a minute right now. Like, this is unnecessary. And with dogs, you can see that physically. Like you can see their eyes scanning, you know? So I think meditation has taught me how to be like empathetic towards dogs like that because it's like, okay, my mind races like a crazy person. I see this dog who's physically showing those signs that their mind is racing like that. So I can kind of empathize with that dog. And I think that's really important too because if you – like if you can't sit still yourself, how how are you supposed to ask your dog to sit still? Like you're not going to be able to. And I think that's really unfair in the first place. But yep. yeah, I think everyone should meditate. <laughs> and, and that, I don't meditate on a daily basis, but I totally like agree with what you're saying. I feel like a big part of my meditation is being present on a daily basis. And that's all and, that is about really because like the meditation part is just the practice but if you bring that mindfulness into your everyday life like that's the point of the practice you know is just bringing that awareness to the present moment and i feel like we're so disconnected to the present moment whereas dogs that's like that's really all they have it is yeah, yeah they're ta they're constantly taking in like the sights and sounds and what's going on around them, the energy around them. Whereas we're like, oh God, I forgot to turn down the air conditioning or, you know, like running our minds with all of these thoughts. We're really like the only animal who isn't present. So yep. I think we have to meet our dogs in the present moment before we can ever try to communicate with them. And if, if you think about it now more than ever, we have this, like the highest level of of reactive dogs that's ever existed in history, right? Like my dad always tells me, he's like, my childhood dog was absolutely perfect. We never used an e-collar on him. He followed us to the school bus off leash. He picked us up from the school bus off leash. He knew not to go upstairs in the carpet, like no reactivity, right? And I'm sure if you go further back, it was even less and less and less, right? Mm -hmm. And I think a big part of that, besides for like the whole mindset of how people think about dogs as their children now, but leaving that out of it, yeah. I think our whole our whole world has become so fast paced and the average person lives in a reactive state that what else would the dog know when all the dog does is observes us and learns by observing and sees this human, this creature that is part of their pack, their family, and that they react to everything in a reactive way yeah. yeah then why should they why should the dog know anything different it's like this is just the way things go i'm supposed to be reactive like i say with with marley so marley was extremely reactive like dangerously reactive and when i had to start working on him when i realized like this is a serious issue i gotta get this gotta get this under control looking back on it at that point in my life i was a very reactive person too mm -hmm. right and I didn't think about what I did. I just did it. I had no impulse control, right? And because of that, I'm sure it helped encourage his reactivity and yeah. vice versa. When I got control over his reactivity, it kind of put things in perspective for me too. And like I say, like we kind of did this journey together of like leaving reactivity behind and moving into a more present way of thinking. And I think that all dog owners, like as hard as it is to think about it like that, think about it like that because that's the reality is like where do you think your dog got its reactivity from yeah so like one of the dogs that i have right now um the owner just had something really traumatic happen to her and that's one of the reasons why she was looking for a dog trainer she's like i just can't do this right now like i can't train this dog right now um and she was like yeah she's just so anxious and i told her that She's really obedient. She's really smart. She knows all of her commands, but it's her mindset that is just racing and is all over the place. And she's so fearful and she's just like constantly on edge. And I was like, I'm just going to like help her 
to relax and teach her how to be calm. And she was like, oh my gosh, can you do that for me? <laughs> and yeah. I, it's like, yes, that's what our dogs are here for. Like they can teach us that. They can teach us how to be more mindful, more present, more aware of our actions, more aware of our body language. I mean, even when I'm, I'll like record my training sessions and I'll go back and watch it and I'm looking at my body language and I'm like, that is not what I was intending to look like. But it's like those moments like that, no wonder why the dog didn't understand what I was asking. I wasn't communicating effectively through my body language. And that's someone who I record myself training dogs all day long and I still have those moments. So yeah. the typical owner, like it's gonna be really hard for them to realize how much their like emotions and physical body language, even just going from like sitting like this, like a dog is gonna pick up this differently than someone who's like this. Yeah. You know? And that's always the first thing I tell owners when they go to walk their dog is stand up straight. You know? Yeah. My favorite thing is like when I'm working with owners and we go on the first walk, once their dogs, the dog has learned how to walk. Now the owner has to learn how to walk. Right. And like, I usually will hand them the leash in motion. So there's that flow uh -huh. and I'll be walking and I'll just hand off the leash. And automatically I would say 99% of the owners that I've ever worked with automatically their hand goes like this. Right. And automatically their shoulders tense up and their head like goes like, and every, I watch it like i am <laughs> yeah and i watch it i'm so conscious of it because like i like to watch body languages as a whole people dogs and i see it immediately how it changes and i'll always kind of like put my hand on their shoulder and just be like relax and like everyone will say like i am and then i'll be like take a deep breath right <laughs> and that's when it like actually settles down because you can't take a deep breath like this it's right. not possible right with all that tension you can't breathe so that breathing forces them to relax but then like when their hands finally drop, that's when there becomes a flow because like it's natural. And the dog is like, the dog is like, what is going on? Like, you're all like this. The dog's like, what happened? What happened? What should I do? What's, what should I, right? Yeah. Like why are you so tense? What's about yeah. that? Yeah. And it's almost like the dog is like nervous. Like they feel that tension, like what's about to happen, right? Like they're put into that anxious state and like, because dogs are, I think the reason why dogs with anxiety or reactivity, it's such a struggle for them is because like you said, they're naturally present animals. So when they're put into this state of trying to think about the future where that's essentially not a thing, it's like, they're just stuck in this, like it doesn't end. It's just a cycle of craziness because they can't even get to like the human step of actually thinking about the future. They're just so like never stop spinning that craziness. Yeah, exactly. And like, I had, so I have a board and train coming up in um, a couple of weeks and the owner reached out to me and she was like, I really like watching your videos, but do you have any videos of a dog? What did she say? That is fearful, aggressive. And both of the dogs that I have right now are technically like fearful, aggressive, like they're reactive, they lunge and bark, but you don't see it because of what I do to set things up in place. You know, like yeah. I'm not going to put the dog in the situation day two of training where it's going to react, you know, like we do things, we have a certain energy that prevent those moments from ever even happening. And I think that's hard for owners to understand because they're like, my dog is doing this thing. My dog is being reactive. I want to fix that. But it's not like fixing that it's, teaching the dog how to be another way and so there's no way for me to be like oh here's your reactive dog video of a dog barking and lunging here's what we do because i would never put a dog in that situation where i know that it's going to like react and i have no control over it you know right mia said if i had a dollar for every time i said relax your arm then i'll never have to work another day in my life <laughs> I'll tell you the the most helpful thing for me with owners and is, is once they're walking with their dog and holding the leash, stop talking about dogs and dog training. Like find something, get to know your owners that you're working with a little bit, even if it's like, what's your favorite food? Like, cool, which restaurants around here are good? Like anything that's not dog related. So like that, and, and I found it works very well. Like start conversation about 
you've already been going over dog stuff with them. They understand how the prong collar works or how the e-collar works by then, right? You're not just starting to teach it once they're holding their leash. I hope not. So by then it's like, talk about anything, get to know them, like compliment them on their shoes, anything but dogs, right? And you'll see their mind start to become their normal self because they want to talk about themselves and people love talking about themselves. And that it'll be a lot smoother. You'll see a difference. And especially if you do it naturally, not like interviewing them. But if it just, I always try to get to know the trainers, I, the owners I work with at least a little bit. Like I, I'll casually ask them what they do for a living or something, just so that I can use it for that to bring it up in a conversation at some point to get their head off of their dog. I like that. See, I'm like, I love talking about dogs. So I'm like, yeah, <laughs> most people don't. <laughs> And most people are not like dog nerds who just like we can sit and talk about dog behavior and like body language for an hour and a half. Like most people are like, okay, but I'm an accountant and I don't give a shit. Like I like pizza. Like talk about something interesting. I'm the worst because I'm one of those people like I would consider myself very introverted. But as far as like subjects that interest me go, I'm like, let me tell you all about this. That's why I loved working at the like zoo jobs. Cause like, look at this cool animal. But like, yeah. if I have to make small talk with people. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know what it doesn't work. But like, it's a good habit to learn how to do for those types of things. Oh, yeah. definitely. I'm gonna have that's, to start practicing that. That's where it comes into play. It's so, it's so good. But like the whole being present thing though. So I got to, it says be here now on my leash hand. I purposely got it on my leash hand so that when I'm holding leashes, book? what? Have you read that book? Uh, yeah, I have it right here. <laughs> I always have it right here. Exactly. My favorite book I've ever read. Okay, so you know how in the beginning when you're reading it, it's like you can say that this book has changed your life, but you're like, every i don't know like you're exactly where you need to be yeah saying that like it hasn't changed anything you read this book for a reason i was like oh shit <laughs> yeah. he's very cool he's a he just died you know that yeah. right but i'll just like open it up on like a random day just like because these pages are all just so cool it's like just fun to even look at it so i'll just open it up on to random pages and read through it yeah but, so cool. i got that I got that on my leash hand on purpose as a reminder for when I'm working with dogs to like recenter myself and stay with them because once you're out there and like in that whole world, it's not going to work anymore. Yeah. That's awesome. So what would you say is your favorite part about what you do? Hmm. Okay. So specifically one thing that I started doing recently was taking dogs on Mama. like back hikes. And I love being around a group of dogs. Like the energy of walking with a group of dogs, like it's, it's amazing. I could never, I would never trade that for anything. Like that's okay. my favorite part of it, I think. And I really like using my own dogs to like help train other dogs. Um, and I've gotten to the point with them where they're really good at picking up on energy and like, I can trust them in situations. I trust them to like navigate situations and kind of guide other dogs. So that's one of my favorite things is just like being in a group of dogs and like watching their dynamics and how they interact. Yeah, that's one thing that I miss a lot from when I worked in my daycare days. You're asking about daycare days. That's like the one thing that I miss a lot is <laughs> every single day spending a couple of hours with a massive group of dogs. It's, it's so cool to watch yeah. them. Like you watch them interact and you're like, oh my God, no wonder why people struggle so much to communicate with their dogs. Like dogs, dog to dog, they're so good at communicating with each other. Yeah. Like, and the, the coolest thing about it is especially when you get to the point like taking them on pack walks or when I was working with them and I had a sense of control over this whole group. It's like you've entered a different realm of like communication and that like it doesn't exist. You can't do that. I mean, I do think that there are parts of it that we do with humans all the time without realizing, but like in how we communicate with each other, like in groups and things like that. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing it with a whole nother animal, it's 
it's I don't it's a trip. Like I don't know how any other way of saying it. Like it's just such a trip to communicate and to understand their language and be able to use it back at them. It's, it's cool. like I feel yeah. like it's a thornberry. Have you, you feel like it? what? <laughs> Eliza Thornberry. She, it, was a show, it was a cartoon on Nickelodeon where she would talk to animals. Um, okay. I don't get any like cultural um, cartoon TV show references ever. So sorry. <laughs> but, it's not just yours. I wouldn't get anybody's. So, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's such a trip. Like to be able to, you're, you're, communicating with another species like another species like how they would do it it's not just talking a new language it's a whole nother level of new language that doesn't exist in human form i think it's such a trip it's very cool yeah i love it that's definitely my favorite and when you get that in a pack sense it's a whole nother level than just one dog on a leash that you're telling to go to place right, right. it's a whole different exactly. thing yeah like everyone is moving as a group and like i started trusting everyone off leash now when dogs and other people walk by and so i like walk over to the side and they all know to go into a down and i'm yeah. like this is so cool like i don't even have to say anything they just do this like just through me walking over to the side they're like all right we got it you know like that yeah. with my so i take my two the two boys my two dogs off leash to a park almost every day there's like a park like couple of blocks away from my house and it's right along the bay and they go swimming okay. there and yeah, that's awesome see yeah. i can't take dogs swimming anywhere because they'll be eaten by alligators or, yeah right. it's in new york city we don't have alligators at least at least you're not supposed to be having them and um well i'm sure there's some crazies in new york city who have them in their apartment <laughs> new york had a pet alligator that they yeah. like yeah but i'll take them to the park and like one of my favorite things to do is I let them just wander off and I completely ignore them and I just walk away. And it's so awesome how they always show up by my side like 30 seconds to a minute later, yeah. no matter what. Like I barely ever use recall with them. I barely ever call them to me. And like, if we need to move, I just move and they move with me. If we need to stop, I stop and the, they just lay down and wait. And it's like, I didn't train them to do that. There was no training that went into that. It was just from That's being with them. That's the whole thing that they do. They stay together. They like. Yeah move as a pack yeah yeah it's a very cool idea and all right here's my big question this is the question that i ask every trainer who i talk to okay, okay. if there was one thing that you could broadcast like right now every single dog owner in the world is hearing it what would be the one thing that you wish they all knew um that the training starts with you not your dog hell yeah i feel like that sums up the whole conversation yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's so important. So many people are like, and that's the back to what you were saying before, like here, train my dog and like bring it back to me as a robot, basically. And it's like there's so much more in, involved in all yeah. of it. It's a real yeah. Uh, yeah, the human end of the training is I think there's the part that's missed the most. And it's why so many do dogs go through many trainers. It's why so many owners struggle from trainer to trainer. It's because a trainer is only a good trainer if they can train the human right. Because yeah. at the end of the day, we're working with like, we're working with families, we're working with owners, we're working with humans a lot more than we're just working with dogs. So if you work with dogs and like, you're a trainer who doesn't like people, like that famous thing that everyone says, like, I work with dogs because I love dogs and I hate people. It's like, so train dogs behind a wall somewhere and then give it the dog to someone else because you're not going to be able to really help in the big situation, you know? Right. You can work in like able to take the dog home. You know, yeah. You could work in like a facility where like you train it and you do all the reps and someone else does the go home session. Then that might work. But where the average situation is where the owner where the trainer works with owners, you have to be able to train the owners much more. And owners have to realize that even if you're sending your dog away, we're working with a trainer it's like don't expect anything to change if you're not going to change yeah exactly cool all right i think we're going to wrap it up on that because that's such a perfect way to end it yeah. so before we go let people know how they can find you if they want to work with you if they want to follow your content if they want to get to know you more yes so i am mostly on instagram at the everyday trainer um i think you can also find me on facebook i have a facebook page yeah my business the same thing the everyday trainer 
Um, and then I also have a website, theeverydaytrainer.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. This is a lot of fun. Thank you all for joining. As always, love you all. Stay kind and be gentle to each other. Have a good night. Bye.